In the 16th century, Europe underwent one of its most important events, the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was a split in Western Christianity that was initiated by the German monk Martin Luther. Um, it, it's one of the biggest events that separates uh, the Middle Ages Europe from modern Europe, and we're going to kind of talk today about, about how this, this event took place. Um, it initiated a, de a debate over all kinds of questions. What is true Christianity? Um, where does authority lie for the Christian? Is it in the scriptures? Is it in the church and their decisions? Um, who gets to interpret scriptures? Should it be individuals or should it only be professional clergy that the church approves of? Um, the Protestant Reformation will also institute a lot of religious fighting uh, in Europe. We'll look at some of these wars in a later lecture. Okay, so I want to say something real quick about the word Catholic. Um, Catholic means universal, so it comes from two Greek words, kata and halos, with, they just mean with respect to the whole. So you could call somebody Catholic, and you just mean they belong to the universal Christian church. But if you use Catholic in the sense of Roman Catholic, that means they belong to the Roman Catholic Church, which is headquartered in Rome. And uh, we'll kind of talk about this today. Um, I got some maps early on. If you look at that, that is a map of the where the story takes place. The, the story of the Protestant Reformation takes place in the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is not a united country. It's basically a whole bunch of different cities, uh, states, um, towns that are ruled by different German princes. So the Holy Roman Empire is not a unified country. Uh, it's a bunch of different places, but it does have an emperor. So that's why sometimes it's thought of as kind of one political unit, but it's really not. Uh, Charles V is going to be the king of Spain and the Holy Roman Emperor. So he sits on the Spanish throne, but he's also ruling the Holy Roman Empire. He's going to be kind of the authority figure uh, throughout this story. And if you look at slide six and seven, you can see how the, before the Protestant Reformation, Europe was Catholic. Um, there was one Christian church centered in Rome. But after the Protestant Reformation, you have all kinds of different versions of Christianity. You have Roman Catholic, you have Lutheran, you have Calvinist, you have Anglican. Uh, Lutheran, Calvinist, Anglican, those would all be considered Protestants. So there's basically two groups of Christians, Catholics and Protestants. And we'll kind of talk about the difference. Okay, so what are some criticisms of the Catholic Church and the Pope? Before this, this uh, event gets going, there's a lot of problems going on. There's problems of clerical immorality. There's, there's priests who spend time with prostitutes and concubines. They produce illegitimate children. Priests get drunk. They gamble. Um, they focus on worldly affairs such as politics or raising armies and fighting wars. Uh, priests and bishops and popes wore fancy clothing. Uh, they lived luxurious lifestyles. Sometimes they would have their own private castles built for them. Uh, a lot of priests are ignorant of the teachings of Christianity. They kind of just go through the motions. They don't even understand Greek and Latin, which are very important languages if you're gonna if you're gonna be a Bible teacher. <clears throat> There's also something called clerical plural pluralism. Basically, you could hold more than one office within the Catholic Church. So you could be a bishop in the Holy Roman Empire and a bishop of some territory in Italy. Well, you can't be both places at once, but you would be getting paid for doing both jobs. Uh, sometimes you might be a bishop, but you would hire somebody to go do your job for you. They would collect a little bit of money, but you would pocket most of it. So there's all kinds of problems like that. Uh, church offices are sold to the highest bidder. This is a practice known as simony. Uh, you sell a bishopric, you know, the, the title of being a bishop to somebody, not based on their qualifications, but based on how much money they have. Um, there's also problems with the church, institutionally speaking. The church is exempt from taxes. They own a lot of land. They raise money in Europe. They get sent to Rome. Uh, so these are all problems going on. But just keep in mind that most bishops, most priests, most monks and nuns don't behave badly. So you know, the problems seem to get all the press, seem to get all the attention, but there's a lot of people doing the right things. Um, some examples of popes that behave badly, Pope Alexander VI, he had a lot of mistresses. 
Pope Julius II was called the warrior pope because he fought so many wars. Uh, pope Leo X spent a lot of money uh, to build buildings throughout Rome, so you need money to build those buildings. Uh, there were a lot of reformers before Martin Luther. Martin Luther is not the first person. Um, there was Francesco Petrarch. There was John Wycliffe. There was Jan Hus. There was Desiderius Erasmus. Uh, basically, what these people wanted is a less less power located in the church hierarchy. Um, they thought if you decentralized authority, you would have less corruption. Uh, they wanted a church that would focus more on spiritual affairs and, and become less greedy. And they also want a vernacular Bible. That just means they want the Bible to be read in people's own languages. So if you're German, they want a German Bible. If you're English, they want an English Bible. Uh, during this time, Latin is the official language of the Catholic Church. Okay, what are some Catholic beliefs? If you belong to the Roman Catholic Church, what are some things that you believe? Well, you believe that you're saved by good works and faith. You also believe that the Pope is Christ's representative on the earth. This comes from a passage in Matthew 16 where Jesus says, And Peter, I will build my church on this rock. Um, so Catholics believe Peter was the first Pope. Uh, they believe that Bible, church traditions, and history, papal, and conciliar council or decisions, the decisions of popes and councils have all equal authority for the Christian. They believe the Eucharist, which is the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine that Christians eat and drink to remember Jesus dying on the cross. They believe that Jesus is physically present. This is something called transubstantiation. Uh, they believe no marriage should be allowed for priests or other clerics. And they believe images like stained glass windows, statues, are helpful for teaching Christians about Christianity. Because remember, a lot of people don't read back in the day, so you need to see pictures, not words. Okay, so there's different views about Martin Luther. If you look at slide 15, uh, some people see him as the Antichrist, a seven-headed beast. Some people see him as not very far removed from Jesus. So who was Martin Luther? He was born in Eiselben, Germany. His mother and father were peasants. Uh, his father did become a copper miner later on, so he did get some wealth. Uh, Martin Luther said he was the descendant of peasants. Um, he did not have a good relationship with his parents. Uh, he talked about how one time his father whipped him so hard he ran away. Uh, he talked about one time he stole a nut from his mother. She was baking with it, and she beat him till the blood flowed. Um, he does have a good education. Uh, he learns to read and write Latin and can speak it fluently. Latin is, a, is the intellectual language of the day. He loved to sing in the choir and go caroling, um, but he always needs approval from his father especially. Um, because his parents were harsh with him, he felt that God was harsh, so he kind of views God the way he viewed his parents. Uh, so he enrolls in the University of Erfurt in 1501. He studies Latin, logic, philosophy. Uh, college back then was very strict. There were set times for when you would get up, study, pray, eat, go to sleep. Um, Luther liked to relax though. He liked to play the lute and drink beer. Uh, his father wanted him to be a lawyer, but his life takes a drastic turn. Uh, Martin Luther was traveling one time and he got caught up in a thunderstorm and the lightning was hitting all around him and he prayed to St. Anne and he said, you know, help me St. Anne, I will become a monk if you save my life. Well, Martin Luther uh, survived the storm so, she so he decides to become a monk. Um, now he also became a monk possibly because a lot of his friends had died in the plague recently. And so he's a college student, his friends die, so he starts questioning his own morality. Um, and he does become a very good monk. Uh, Martin Luther said, I was a pious monk, and so strictly observed the rules of my order, that if ever a monk got into heaven by monkery, so should I also have gotten there. If I had lasted longer, I should have tortured myself to death with watching, praying, reading, and other work. So basically, Martin Luther decides, I'm going to do enough good works to get into heaven. And being a monk is one of those good works. Um, his father was not happy when he learned out he was going to be a monk instead of a lawyer. But little did Martin Luther's father know that he would create more uh, history as a monk than a lawyer. Uh, the official monastery that Martin Luther joins was called the Reformed Congregation. 
of the Era Medical Order of St. Augustine. Um, life in the monastery required hard work, long hours and prayer. Um, Martin Luther would beg for food to show that he's relying on God and not on himself. Uh, he took a vow of poverty. There's also an intellectual element. Uh, you would study the scriptures. Uh, you would read other important books. So being a monk is not all about being in solitude. They had a, uh, they, they grew, they grew, they produced their own beer at their uh, monastery. So there's, there's work there too. <clears throat> um, like I said, Martin Luther believed that the more good works he did, the better his, his uh, situation would be in the afterlife. Uh, he thought self-sacrifice would, would guarantee his salvation. Uh, he would confess to others his sins, sometimes for six hours at a time. Uh, even the priest got tired of hearing him confessing. One time a priest told him, you know, Martin, I wish you would go out and kill somebody or commit adultery. Then at least you would have something serious to confess about. You know, Martin Luther was the kind of guy that would stub his toe and think a curse word, and then he would feel like he had to go confess. Martin Luther said, God's word is too high and too hard for anyone to fulfill to fulfill it, and this is proved not merely by our Lord's own word, but by my own experience and feeling. So no matter what he does, he can't quite please God, he feels like. Um, however irreproachably I lived as a monk, I could feel myself only as a sinner with a conscience full of guilt. Nor could I feel I pleased God with my labor. Indeed, I hated this God, and so I raged against myself with a fierce and troubled conscience. Um, one of the people that helps him out is a guy named Johannes von Staupitz. Uh, Johann basically takes Martin Luther under his wing. He makes him a professor of Bible studies at the university. And basically, uh, Staupitz thinks if I give Martin Luther so much work, he won't be able to worry about his salvation. He'll just be too tired in the, in the evening. Um, Martin Luther once said, you know, hey, Professor Staupitz, you're giving me too much work. You're going to kill me. And Staupitz said something to the effect of, that's okay. God, God will have work for you once, you once you get to heaven. Now, Martin Luther is sent on a mission to Rome by his, uh, his monastery. Now, he's very excited to go to Rome because Rome is the center of Christianity if you're a European. Now, there's a video clip on slide 38. I would like you to watch this and just see what Martin Luther's reaction is like. He's very excited, but once he goes there, he experiences a lot of uh, letdown. He sees priests visiting prostitutes. Uh, he sees priests going through the motion. He sees people paying money to get into heaven. A lot of things he doesn't like. He comes away from this trip to Rome wondering if Christianity is even true. So watch those video clips and you'll kind of see that. Now he comes back from Rome. He, he graduates. He becomes a doctor of theology. Um, he teaches the Bible. Uh, Martin Luther loved the intellectual lifestyle. He would often invite students to his house and they would eat and his wife would tell Martin like, hey Martin, you know, you need to shut up because if you keep talking, nobody can eat. Now Martin Luther has this aha moment all of a sudden. He reads a passage in Romans. Romans is one of the most important books in the Christian New Testament. Uh, it's written by the Apostle Paul. And the section he read was uh, Romans 1.17. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is shown through faith for faith. He who is righteous through faith shall live. Luther kind of has this aha moment. He sees both, God, both faith and God's grace as gifts. You don't earn your salvation. They're just gifts from God. Uh, Martin Luther would say, you're always a sinner. You're always sorry for your sin. But no matter what, you're always right with God. And I think a good uh, illustration is, there's a, there's a verse in Romans uh, that says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And this is kind of what Martin Luther is talking about. On one side are wages, sin, and death. And on the other side is, is the gift of eternal life, which you get through Christ Jesus, according to Christianity. And you can't get over to you know heaven, to eternal life, because your sin separates you. But Jesus on the cross is the is the bridge that allows you to get there. And it's just a gift from God. You don't have to earn anything. Paul says in, in Romans that if you believe that Christ Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead, um, you just have to believe those things and you're right with God. Now you have to live a life according to Christian principles, but that's how you get started.
Luther said, it seemed to me as if I had been born again and as if I, and as if I had entered paradise through newly opened doors. All at once the Bible began to speak in quite a different way to me. The very phrase, the righteousness of God, which I had hated before, was the one that I now loved the best. Now Martin Luther came up with something called the three alone. There's actually five, but these three are most important. Sola fides, that just means faith alone. Sola scriptura, that means scriptures alone. And then sola gratia, grace alone. So sola fides means only scripture should guide a Christian, not what the Pope says, not what church councils say. Um, sorry, sola scriptura says that. Sola fides is faith alone. You're not saved by your good works, you're saved by faith. And then sola gratia, it's only by God's grace, by his gift to you that you can enter heaven. Now, what ends up kickstarting this problem is, is something called indulgences. Basically, what an indulgence was is uh, it was a piece of paper that got you out of purgatory quicker. Now, when you die and you're a Christian, according to the Catholic Church, you would go to a place called purgatory to purge you of your sins. You're not quite good enough to get into heaven. The things you do on earth can get you into get you out of purgatory quicker. So prayer, fasting, doing good deeds, giving money to the church. Well, what happens over time is people just start giving money to the church to buy their way out of purgatory. So people, one of the things Luther sees in Rome is people are giving the church money and for their relatives who are in purgatory so that they'll get into heaven quicker. Martin Luther doesn't think that's right. What happened was, is Pope Leo X had something called the Jubilee Indulgence. Basically, he's selling indulgences to raise money to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, this magnificent building in Rome. So that he sends this guy, Johannes Tetzel, throughout Germany to basically sell these indulgences. Tetzel would whip people up with descriptions of their loved ones suffering in purgatory. Um, here's a description. The papal bull, the Pope's document proclaiming the Jubilee indulgence, was carried on a satin or gold embroidered cushion, and all the priests and monks, the town council, schoolmasters, scholars, men, women, and children, all went out to meet Tetzel with banners and lighted tapers, with songs and processions. Then all the bells were rung and the organs played. Uh, another person said, it is incredible what this ignorant monk said and preached. He gave sealed letters stating that even the sins which a man was intending to commit would be forgiven. The Pope, he said, had more power than all the apostles, all the angels and saints, more even than the Virgin Mary herself. For these were all subject to Christ, but the Pope was equal to Christ. And supposedly, Tetzel had this little jingle. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, at once the soul up to heaven springs. So as soon as you give the money, your loved one gets into heaven. Uh, Luther thinks this is a mistake. He believes that God's forgiveness is free and cannot be purchased, so he decides to protest. He wrote a letter to Albrecht of Mainz. He was the bishop, but he also nailed this letter called the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany on October 31st, 1517. <laughs> Luther said, simple folk believe that when they have bought the indulgence, they have secured their salvation. They believe that the moment the money jingles in the box, souls are delivered from purgatory, and that all sins will be forgiven through a letter of indulgence. Ah, dear God, in this way the souls who are committed to your care, dear Father, are being led in the paths of death. Christ has nowhere commanded indulgences to be preached, only the gospel. Now these 95 theses were written in Latin, so he's not calling for like a revolution against the church. He just wants to talk with church leaders and explain to them why he thinks this is wrong. But pretty soon somebody translates these 95 theses into Germany, or into German. Now the printing press already exists, so, so these 95 theses get spread pretty quick. And pretty soon everybody knows what's happening. Um, now there's also a political element to this. If you look at slide 55, you can see how some of that indulgence money is going to go out of Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, and it's going to go to Rome. So if you're a German prince... You don't really like that your tax revenue is not going to you, but it's going to Rome. So there's a political element to this. Now, the church deals with Luther in different ways. Basically, they ask the monastery to deal with him. Um, they 
ask a representative of the Pope to deal with him. So these are all debates uh, that Martin Luther has. Um, eventually, he gets interviewed in Leipzig by Dr. John Eck. Um, it's a packed house. It's kind of a debate. Uh, people come to support Luther. Uh, a, a witness said, by now the whole of Germany is in full revolt. Nine-tenths raise the war cry Luther, while the watchword of the other tenth who are indifferent to Luther is death to the Roman Curia. So basically, nine out of ten people support Martin Luther, and the other one out of ten hate the Pope. So Luther starts formulating his ideas. He writes three pamphlets in 1520. Uh, these kind of flush out his ideas and his thinking. Uh, the Pope decides to excommunicate, kick out Martin Luther from the church. He issues uh, a papal bull, which is just a papal document, ex surge domine. And basically he says, Luther, you have 60 days to, to recant, to change your ideas. And if you don't, we're going to excommunicate you from the church. Martin Luther burns this document when he receives it. The climax of this conflict is the Diet of Worms. Worms is a city in the Holy Roman Empire, and Diet just means an assembly or a gathering. So Charles V comes to see Martin Luther and hear his point of view. Um, so if you look at slide 69, there's another video clip I would like you to watch. This is a good representation of what happened. But basically, Martin Luther is asked, you know, are these your ideas? They put a, a table of his writings out and they say, are these your ideas? And Martin Luther says, yes. And they say, you need to renounce them. And he says, I, can't, I cannot renounce them. Um, I believe that this is right. My conscience is telling me to do this. So what ends up happening is Charles V, he was open, up in the air. Should I take Martin Luther's side or should I side with the church? But he decides to, to, to go on the church's side. Uh, he said, I have resolved to follow in their steps. A single friar who goes counter to all Christianity for a thousand years must be wrong. After having heard yesterday the obstinate defense of Luther, I regret that I have so long delayed in proceeding against him and his false teaching. I will have no more to do with him. He may return under safe conduct, but without preaching or making any tumult, I will proceed against him as a notorious heretic. Then the Diet of Worms issues something called the Edict of Worms. It declares Martin Luther an outlaw. It says you are not allowed to give him lodging, food, shelter, uh, and any of his property can be taken, and anyone that supports him, their property can be taken. Luther ends up getting kidnapped, and I kind of say kidnapped lightly. Frederick the Wise, uh, he's a German prince. He hides Luther in the Wartburg Castle, and uh, Martin Luther becomes... This, this guy named Junker George. Junker is a German nobleman. So basically he's in disguise living at this castle so he can't get taken by the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> when he's at Wartburg, he translates the New Testament into German. Uh, he's often sick and depressed. Uh, a lot of reforms start taking place while he's at the Wartburg castle. Uh, monks, priests, nuns get married. Communion, the Eucharist is made less formal. Um, priests adopt similar dress. Some places there's too much reform. Windows, stained glass windows, pictures, statues get smashed. Uh, church lands are confiscated. Church schools are shut down. There's violence. Luther comes out of hiding to oppose this violence. He says, I opposed indulgences and all the priests, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. So basically, Martin Luther says it's not okay to form an uprising. Now, there's something called the German Peasants' War. This, this mostly took place in 1525, but basically, the German peasants rebel against their landlords, against the German princes. Um, they refuse to pay their taxes. They refuse church ties uh, or their feudal dues. They attack their landlords, they plunder monasteries, they demand autonomy for their villages, they want to pick their own priests. Um, Luther comes out against this. He writes a pamphlet called Against the Robbing and Murdering Hordes of Peasants, and he basically says, insurrection is never okay. So he gives the German princes permission to crush this, um, and, and scholars think 75 to 100,000 people were killed in the German Peasants' War. Now, why this, while this stuff is going on, the Catholics and Protestants are still meeting and talking. One of these meetings was called the Diet of Speyer, 
And basically, this is where Protestants get their names. Charles V brought Catholics and Protestants together. They talk about their differences. The Catholics are the majority, and they decide that Luther is heretical. So the Protestants, those that support Luther, they protest the Catholics. So Protestant comes from the name protest, what they did at the Diet of Speyer. Later on, there's a Diet at Augsburg. Basically, um, the Protestants and the Catholics, again, get together and talk about their ideas. Um, but the Catholics won't budge, and neither will the Protestants. The Protestants form a, a military alliance, a defensive alliance called the Schmalkaldic League. Basically, they're worried that Charles V and the Catholics are going to attack them. And they do have a, a war called the Schmalkaldic Wars. It's kind of a series of wars. Basically, Charles V and the Catholics fight the German supporters of Luther. Now, Charles V wins all the battles, or most of them, but he can never quite stamp out Protestant Protestantism. So something called the Peace of Peace of Passau gets passed. Later on, the Peace of Augsburg gets passed. This is what you need to remember. This is really important. Um, it established the principle, cuius regio, eius religio. That's Latin for whose realm, his religion. So basically, if your German prince is a Protestant, you have to be Protestant. If your German prince is Catholic, you have to be Catholic. Now what this peace does is it allows people to leave and go to a province of their choice. So if you're a Protestant and your prince is Catholic, you can leave and go to a Protestant prince's realm. And it says don't harass people as they're trying to leave. What ends up happening is most of northern Germany becomes Protestant and a lot of southern Germany becomes Catholic. Uh, Martin Luther dies in 1546. So just kind of to sum up... Uh, what Martin Luther did is he broke Western Christianity, and we're kind of going to see this continue. More countries are going to start breaking away from Catholicism. Uh, he wanted the Bible in, in a vernacular language, so he wants Germans to have a German Bible, English to have an English Bible, and so on. Um, Martin Luther says you don't need to be a professional clergy, uh, a professional priest. Martin Luther believed in something called the priesthood of all believers. So if you're a committed Christian, you can basically be a priest by praying, reading the Bible. And Martin Luther also rejected traditions not found in scripture. So anything the Catholic Church does that's not in scripture, Martin Luther is against it. So next time we'll take a look at how the Protestant Reformation spread to other countries uh, in Europe.